Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is February 2nd, 2012, and my guest is Adam Davidson of NPR's Planet Money and the economics columnist for the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Adam, welcome to Econ Talk. Hey, Russ. It really is an honor to be on the podcast. I love this podcast. You Thank know. you. Uh, you're, you recently wrote a fascinating article in The Atlantic on what has happened to the U.S. manufacturing sector and what might be happening in the future. And you used a factory in Greenville, South Carolina as emblematic of that story. Start by talking about the factory. What do they do there? They're uh, an auto parts manufacturer. Specifically, they manufacture aftermarket auto parts. And I I specifically set out to find an aftermarket auto parts factory because um, auto parts are are one product line that are made in the U.S. and in China. So the competition is rather direct. You know, there's so many types of things that China makes and we don't make anymore, like T-shirts or computer assembly or whatever. And then there are things that we do that China doesn't do, like, you know, high-end medical equipment or avionics, you know, that kind of thing. And I really wanted to find a factory on the front lines. And auto parts seem like the right way to go. And then the aftermarket, you know, these are the 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 OE, the original equipment manufacturers are the ones who make it who make products directly for Ford or GM or Toyota or who you know for for the car that comes off the assembly line when it's new. The aftermarket are the folks who make replacement parts. So the OE world is its own universe and they're not really competing, you know, for shelf space in AutoZone right. or whatever like the aftermarket is. And so this factory in South Carolina makes uh, fuel injectors, right? Yeah, they that one of they make two major lines. They uh, th- things to do with elect- the electronic systems and then fuel injectors, and that's what I focused on: fuel injectors. And so the interesting question, and it's, and it's a great choice of of market. The interesting question is: Why are some things made here and some things made in China or elsewhere? Exactly, and 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 what interested me about this particular company, Standard Motor Products is I, I, I came to think of them as sort of this, when you think of the company overall, I mean, it has many thousands of employees, but it, it's sort of like this machine constantly scanning every car in America to figure out what makes sense to be made in the U.S. and what makes sense to be made in China. They also have a plant in Mexico, a plant in Poland. I should say they don't have a plant in China, but they do source a lot of products in China from other factories. Uh, and and there's sort of a constant process where they're evaluating all sorts of auto parts. I think they have something like 25,000 different SKUs, different individual products that they sell, and and about half of them they make, and around half of them they buy from other places. So they're constantly figuring out, hey, this weird little part. I think we could do it better than China. We can make it cheaper than China, but this other part, China's going to you know always be able to make that cheaper, so we'll just buy it from China. We won't bother trying to make it ourselves. But as you point out, cheaper is not so straightforward all the time. There's things other than just the cost of the labor and materials. Yeah, very much so. And and, and that's something I, you know, we probably can get into. But from the perspective of, um, of Standard Motor, what they're trying to do is meet the needs of basically their, their commitment to their customer. And their customer is not you and me. Their customer is um, the the big um, auto parts retailers like AutoZone and Napa, and then big auto parts wholesalers, and and so what they their commitment to to those folks is that whenever one of us walks in the door and we have some weird part on some weird car that nobody ever sees, Standard Motor will be able to get it to that location within 48 hours, and preferably much much faster than 48 hours, and so having a part. Um, to reduce. Made in China, even if China made it beautifully and perfectly and cheaply, um, yeah, it, it's useless. It's it's you know a month away by ship. Um, so so that's one big issue. And then the other issue is um, you know the 
Auto parts are, are highly regulated. Um, their commitment is to make parts as reliable, if not more reliable, than the original part. And, you know, a fuel injector, for example, that's expected to run with zero problems for for at least a decade, if not longer. And so there are parts that they just find you can't, you can get China to make them cheaper, but you can't get a Chinese factory, at least not yet, to make them reliably uh, with, with the level of quality that, that's required. Which is surprising because I think what is surprising to a novice like me because I think we have in the back of our mind this idea that oh, all these factories are so mechanized. It, they're so, there's so much robotic help and a robot, yeah, 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 that's as smart as you – as precise, as, as careful, as repeatable, replicable as, as you'd want. So why is it that there are uh, – a qual- why could, how can there be a quality difference between what a factory stamps out here versus there? So that, that was one of my – the big lessons that I learned is what, as the machinery that, that factories use gets more and more complicated, more and more expensive, more, more and more sophisticated, it requires – more and more human intelligence to operate it. It doesn't require more people. It requires a lot fewer people. But the people that these new machines require are often need to have far more skill and, and be able to um, think through problems with, with much greater sophistication. And China, I have been to auto parts factories in China, and the it's just much rarer. Obviously, there are incredibly bright Chinese engineers, and there's you know you you could find someone in China who can do it. It's just much less likely that any given factory is going to have enough of those people. Is going to have a pipeline of sort of these are skilled blue collar workers. So I'm uh, you know right now I'm not talking about someone with a master's in engineering. I'm talking about someone with a high school degree and two years of technical college and maybe you know a few years experience. Someone who understands metallurgy, who understands a bit of chemistry and electronics, who understands um, computer programming, the very difficult and obscure computer programs that run these machines. And that's just, there's just not a lot of those people in China right now. And um, and so so the more, you know, the, the picture I have is, you know, it, you picture a factory in the 50s. My, my grandfather ran um, factories for Cincinnati Millicron, which was a big manufacturer of machine tools. And, you know, you just picture hundreds of guys, and back then, of course, it was mostly guys, um, each one doing one particular part, using their muscle more than their brains. And maybe hundreds of those people are replaced by one or two big expensive machines that is only operated by one person. So you've lost a lot of of man hours, a lot of workers, but that one person is is more valuable, more crucial to the factory than 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 any one worker was uh, fifty sixty yeah. years ago. <clears throat> well, let me just comment on that because a couple things come to mind. One is when I think of that, I always think of Charlie Chaplin in Modern Times. You know, relentlessly, endlessly turning one bolt with the same wrench. You know, <clears throat> we didn't know to call it carpal tunnel syndrome then, but he's you know he's having a very has a dreary life, um, uh, and that was what we thought of as as manufacturing in the old days. Now when that machine comes along, first of all, there's something really good about that because instead of a person having to do it, uh, it's a machine does it. A machine doesn't get bored. That's nice. A machine doesn't get carpal tunnel syndrome. That's nice. Th- it's true the jobs disappear, but other jobs are going to get created somewhere else, both making the machine, designing and making that machine, and also elsewhere now that that, that good is going to be cheaper because you don't have to have as many workers – there's going to be res- there are going to be resources freed up to create other stuff, new products that people can work on. That's the the whole idea behind creative destruction. And then the other point I want to make that I think is we often forget is, and your factory store brings it to light, that one worker who replaced with now running this very fancy, sophisticated machine that replaces all the workers. In some dimension, that one worker is unbelievably productive, in the sense that the total output divided by people hours. The way we measure it is very high. That person looks like he's making a lot of, of the good, but he's not really doing very much often in some of these factories. And you gave a delightful um, story that in a textile mill, which used to be very labor intensive and is now very machine intensive, uh, you said in the joke in the in the textile world is that they only pay two people, right? They only have two employees. Right. A man and a dog, and the man's there to feed the dog, and the dog's there to keep the man away from the machine. Yeah, and I just love that. And, and 
it's, yeah, that's it captures, joke I heard, I think, in, in uh, Alabama at a textile mill. But it really captures what's happened to much of modern American manufacturing, which is there are people in the plant. There aren't very many. Uh, they, in a sense, are very productive in that what they oversee produces an enormous amount of stuff. But most of the productivity, most of the skill is embedded in the machinery. And as a result, that person doesn't earn a big salary. Their main job is to make sure the stuff doesn't break down or to put to you know take care of it when it does break down. Most of the so-called work is going on uh, with the machinery. And we talked – we had a podcast this past summer uh, about the potato chip uh, world. The potato right, chip world great, yeah. is very mechanized. Uh, I've been to a, a modern pencil factory. There's a handful of people in these plants. They do very little except keep an eye on things. But that's not – what happens in that plant in South Carolina that makes the fuel injectors? And the answer is obvious that the plants that don't require a lot of people, many of them are gone, as you point out in the article. So explain why the fuel injector plant still has so many people in it. Sure. So, so first of all, the, the, uh, let, I, I want to respond to the, the skilled workers, and yeah, then I want to talk about the unskilled workers, if that's okay. So, so um, on the skilled side, I mean, I think there's no question that certainly for me, I, I think for most people, you'd rather be a skilled worker now than an unskilled worker when there are lots of jobs. It's just much more interesting. You're doing lots of different things every day. You're using your brain. Um, you, you probably will not get carpal tunnel. I mean, instead of, you know, physically bending metal or cutting metal, you are typing into a keypad, you're taking samples and checking to make sure that, that the machine is operating on spec. And the crucial thing is change-ups, setups um, for a new product. So if this machine, if, if every fuel injector for every car was exactly the same and you needed to set the car up, you know, January 1st and it would just run um, – Till December 31st, you would not you would not want to invest in a highly skilled worker who who commands you know a better wage. You know that that's the kind of thing China can do perfectly well. You just you know let a machine run and 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 throw some labor at it just to be there in case it breaks down or to you know restock the the parts right. or whatever it is. Um, certainly in China and even in the U.S. as we'll get into, robotics sometimes are more expensive than people, so you you don't you, you keep people around instead of robots. But um, but one area where the U.S. still has a a very strong competitive advantage and comparative advantage is in areas that require frequent setup changes. So um, if, if you think of the fuel injector, you know. Ford has a different kind of fuel injector than GM does. And then this line of Ford cars has a different set than that line. And Toyota will have its own set. So um, standard motor products, I, I forget the exact number, but there's at least hundreds of different kinds of fuel injectors that they're supplying. And, and, and to quote Adam Smith, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. If the, that particular line of Ford was so large – that a particular kind of fuel injector, you could have a factory that just made those, but none of these are big enough to justify their own factory. So any one factory is going to have to have a little bit of diversity in it. Right. Exactly. Now, on the original equipment side, it makes a lot of sense to have a factory really focused because in that case, Ford will call Bosch or one of the other big global manufacturers and say, we're making a commitment to you for a year or two or three that we're just going to buy millions of the exact same fuel injector. And, and those companies, I mean, it's almost like an annuity. I mean, you just, you just set your machines up and, 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 and you do um, just churn them out, churn them out, churn them out. Now, because the auto industry is moving to just in time and, you know, the Toyota production system, there, there's a lot of value to having that manufacturing done near the Ford plant in the U.S. So um, as far as I know, and I looked hard into this, there are no Chinese-made fuel injectors sold in the U.S. or, you know, OE or aftermarket. Um, but the But for standard... They don't know exactly who's going to walk through the door, and there are and that's some part of what they're, that's part of what they're you know, that's part of what they're selling, right? Right. What they're se- part the, of their the flexibility is, is flexibility exactly. So you know, you're selling like the F one fifty, which might have I don't know tens of millions on the road, and so you're pretty sure you're going to get a thousand F one fifty fuel injector orders every month. But you know, there might be some you know old Subaru or whatever that there's, you know, 15,000 on the road and you just never know when, when the need for that particular injector comes up. And so they're able to very quickly change the machinery. Now that means 
physically changing the mechanics inside the machine. It means changing the computer program that tells the machine what to do. Whenever you do a setup change, it requires um, you know, just a host of really precise measurements that really a human has to do. Computers, robots can't do that yet. The, the machine, the, the factory still has one of the really old um, turning machines, like basically a giant industrial sized lathe from the old world, the pre computerized world, where you actually move big chunks of metal and it's sort of this, these big gears that tell the, the lathe, you know, how fast to cut and how precise to cut. And if they want to change that old style, the style that existed here until, say, the 80s, into the 80s, um, that's over a day to, to change that. And so they only use that for, to make really standardized parts that they're going to just make tons of all the time. These new computers, it's about an hour and a half to change it. And believe me, they are working hard to get that hour and a half down to a few minutes. You know, the, sure. that, that's the goal. But, but that requires paying a highly skilled person. You need someone who really, um, who, who can troubleshoot a very, very complicated system as it's being changed. Now, they might not change it every day. They might not change it every week. And so the rest of the time, they're going to have a highly skilled worker doing things that probably a lower skilled worker could do, you know, just sort of the routine uh, maintenance and stuff. But, um, but it's worth it to them. I mean, these machines cost, um, I think, half a million each. They have Three of them, um, the, much there's, there's millions and millions of, of profits tied up in these machines. So it's worth it to them to pay twice as much or whatever it is for a highly skilled worker, even if they're only using the fullness of that high skilled worker's brain um, a few times a month. So that person, I think, is a is called a machinist, right? Yeah, a machinist. Yeah. And and that what skills? I was fascinated by what skills it's useful. Obviously, you have to be smart. You have to be diligent. You have to be careful. Those are all important skills, but there's some explicit skills that person has to have. Right. And and what struck me is the the, the successful machinists I met, uh, it, it's not, there's not an end point. They're learning all their lives. I mean, they're, you know, they're, it, it's kind of like you and me. I mean, you, you and I have chosen jobs where we can constantly be challenged by new intellectual challenges. And Speak for and yourself, I, Adam. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah I true. pretty you, much have mastered. Right. 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 You learned everything in yeah, grad school. I'm done. And, yeah, it's all. And then just, you read Hayek yeah, and yeah, some new just things application. Then, no. Yeah. No. I, I'm with you there. Totally yeah. with you. And and so so I focused on this guy Luke Hutchins who so so here's the specific skills he has. He had a lot of math abilities. Just um, which I did in high school. I was very good at math. Um, I, I, I got to say I was thinking, can I be this person? And and I'll tell you why I decided I cannot. Like I, 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 I there's no way I could. I could be as successful as him at this field. So he had a lot of math ability. He said calculus is particularly helpful. That's so wild, though. It got to stop there because I yeah. read that. It got like a sentence. I could have had – and a part of me wanted the entire article to be about that. My wife teaches high school math, and we talk all the time about the value of various skills and, and, and who, who can use them. And whether it just – is it just good for your brain to learn these skills in math or does it actually come in handy? And certainly if you're going to be an engineer, then it's good to know math. But a machinist needs to know calculus? Why? I was really surprised Why? by that too. And I – and this is where it gets beyond me. I got to be honest. I, I – I, and I'm pretty good with computers. I'm a certified Mac tech, although please don't call me for <laughs> Mac tech support. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm pretty good at computers. I know a tiny bit of programming, but not much. And and I've tried to learn the CNC, the Computer Numerically uh, Controlled Programming Language. It's very confusing. It's all about x axes, y axes, and z axes, and um, and it and it's about the, this is not a graphical user interface. I mean, you're you're controlling a physical process so that obviously exists in three dimensions, but you're doing it through, I mean, it looks a lot like a DOS screen. It's just um, X, Y, Z, and then the rotation of the motor and the, um, you know, and, 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 um, and on, on these more complicated machines, they're called multi-access. This is sort of the latest breakthrough. Several, they're, they're operating on several different axes. So it's, you know, it's it's almost it feels like string theory or something. I mean, there's like nine dimensions that you have to keep in mind. Um, while and 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 the screen you're looking at is just numbers. It's not. So for those those of you listening at home or out on your car who are uh, 
or under the excuse me who are under the age of 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 thirty, DOS was a primitive computer interface of the previous century. Is that is that what you're referring to the the yeah, green exactly. where, the green and no black graphics. the green yeah. and black screen? <laughs> right. Now I got to say it's weird because they are more modern computer screens. So so it's sort of like you bought a modern computer screen and just yeah. used it for DOS. numbers and letters yeah. and no no three dimensional imagery. But there's calculus in there, huh? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I think when you're trying to compute the, you know, the, the, and I, I'm way out of my depth, but you know, the, the, there's one spinning surface and another spinning surface comes in contact with it, and you want it to end up creating a particular shape. Oh. Um, you know, I, I think it's algebra and calculus that you that you need. But okay, um, so this, but I'm, I'm way out of my depth here. Okay, but that's but, not all. I mean, so so there's that, there's which more. is hard enough. Then there's metallurgy, uh, you know, a, just any one fuel injector, you know, which might cost you five bucks at AutoZone or whatever, is made up of many different alloys, many different types of metal, just uh, different types of aluminum and others. There's parts of the fuel injector you want to be highly magnetic because the way a fuel injector injects fuel is a little magnet um, opens and closes and and and. and and forces um, the valve to open and close. But there are other parts you don't want to be magnetic at all. There are parts that you want to conduct in, um, electricity. There's parts you don't want to conduct electricity. There are parts that are going to have huge force on them for a decade, and there are parts that aren't going to have much force. And there's parts that where friction is your huge concern. So there's but, many different kinds of aluminum. But does the machinist need to understand all that? Doesn't, doesn't he just open the book and say, oh, this has got – it's a recipe, isn't it? You'd think it's not, though. <laughs> I, I think if you were doing one, then you could just set it up, and um, and and the machinist, you know, you could have an engineer kind of create that book. But since they're doing so many at so many different times, since they're doing it at such precise levels, there's just a level of chaos that re- that you want the person doing it to have insight. And so the the metal ch- there, there's. Um, it, it's not diamond. It's a a, um, a certain kind of uh, carbide cutting tool that cuts the metal, and you know everything is done to enormous precision. But what the machinists told me is, inevitably, every time it just doesn't quite work right. It hmm. does. It's just not quite on spec. And when I say on spec for a fuel injector, there are parts of the fuel injector that are machined to a half a micron, which a human hair is 70 microns. Ouch. Half a micron is smaller than a virus. So, and, and if you're off by half a micron, that fuel injector will, e- will be useless. It will either stay open permanently and just fuel will spill out or it'll stay closed and, and you won't get any fuel at all. Um, the entire movement of, of the fuel injector, a fuel injector is basically like a incredibly high-tech syringe where it, you know, plunges back and forth, squirting a very precise amount of fuel into your engine block um, to, to spark and, you know, cause the explosion that moves the crankshaft that moves your car forward. The entire movement is 70 microns. That's, that, that's the, you know, the opening and closing of the syringe. Yeah, I think you need to stop here because if you keep going, I'm going to be anxious about getting home. I mean, right. it seems like I, you know, I always sort of take it for granted that the car works, but maybe I'm overconfident. Uh, it is. Let me ask you a different question, though. How does the machinist decide that something is on or off spec? How does that measurement get made of a half a micron? So yeah, so so there's. Does he, more eyeball, of does the, he eyeball it? <laughs> yeah, more, no, no, yeah. More of the machinist's job is at this table that looks more. Like a you know high school science lab, there are microscopes, there are calipers, there's incredibly precise um, scales, and you know different things have to be obviously measured um, in in different ways, and and then for for the really tight stuff, there are these um, sort of amazing roundness testers, which are sort of these massive machines. They kind of reminded me of um, what's that. Spiral writing thing where do you remember the kids have yeah, that? Yeah. Where, um, it should be a, yeah. Something I think it's spirograph. It's it, it's like a Ouija board, but it doesn't. Uh, yeah, I remember. I know what you mean. 
Yeah, so, so the roundness tester kind of works like that. You put the round thing in this giant metal mesh thing, and it spins around, and somehow that figures out whether it's the right roundness, the yeah, right degree of perfect cool. roundness. And, um, and so... When you when you when you so when you make a change up to a new product, you basically you you, you run the machine, you, you you put the new metal in, you put the new cutting tool in, you put the new program in, you run it, you take a part out, and it's wrong. Yeah, you, it just always is wrong. So you bring it to your little science desk, and you look at it through microscopes, and you use the caliper and you weigh it. And then you do this really important thing. You make judgments. You make you use your brain to problem solve. Yeah. You you figure out, um, you know, is this problem that the cutting t- tool is coming in too close, or is this because this particular type of cutting tool reacts with this particular type of metal in a way that's different from how we program the machine, or is there not enough of the lubricating fluid that's coming through, or did is there a microscopic tear in the cutting tool? that the human eye and the finger can't pick up but is, you know, wreaking havoc uh, uh, on the machine. So, so and, and that, I mean, that right there, that moment, a human brain with the proper knowledge, the proper experience, to look at a machine, at a part that isn't quite right and figure out how to tell the machine to make it right. Yeah, that's an art. It's not a, that's an art, and that's you know a big part of U.S. competitiveness. That's a much, much more difficult process in China. For a whole host of reasons. It's not just you don't have Luke Hutchins with years of calculus training and metallurgy training, et cetera, et cetera. It's because um, you don't have the, this, an entire system that supports that one person making that one decision. You have much cruder oversight, much cruder quality assurance, and it just doesn't allow you to react anywhere near as, as quickly or as reliably. For some reason, I think of my grandfather who had a set of false teeth, and if they weren't comfortable, he would take them out of his mouth and take a pocket knife and adjust them. But I, it's something like that. Uh, it it's kind of on a much more precise it's kind, level. It's kind yeah. of a remarkable thing. And again, it's a whole world that – it's what I love about these kind of stories is it's a whole world of you don't know anything about until you, until you discover it. So how much does someone oh, like – I, I mean I was talking to this guy, Luke Hutchins, and so he starts telling me about the cutting tools, which is its own world of, yeah. of advanced ceramics, um, incredibly complex. And he's telling – he's going on and on about these cutting tools and their properties and how they're made. And then he just points at this other guy and says, well, Ralph is really our cutting tool expert. I just don't know any – I really want to take some courses on cutting tools. <laughs> And I want to learn about cutting tool properties. And then we start talking about electronics. He knows everything about electronics as far as I can tell, certainly more than anyone I know knows. And he says, yeah, I'm really – I got to learn more electronics. I just don't know enough about it. And so it, it was exciting to see, you know, here's a guy who I think, you know, many snobby college people in New York would, would just look at in his blue overalls and, you know, his thick southern twang and he works in an auto parts factory and not realize he's on an intellectual journey that yeah. – you know, is, is, is for him very, very thrilling and exciting. Yeah, no, that's really beautiful. And, and what kind of salary and benefits do people like that make in that, in that world, for that so level here, of skill? Here's a puzzle, and, and this is what I want to look into next. Um, so uh, so I, I do want to talk about unskilled workers, and if we can get to yeah, that. Yeah, no, and, we're going to get to that next. Yeah, and, and unskilled is a, is a loaded term, but I'll – Describe Less it. skilled than than this person. Though. Well, the way Standard Motor defines it is unskilled is someone who can learn everything they need to know at their job in a day, um, and skilled is someone who needs a lot of knowledge before you'll hire them, and then needs a lot of training on the job. So that you know, you can think of an unskilled worker as they're basically replaceable by any other unskilled worker. Yeah. Whereas a skilled worker, that's a special special person, but. The wages for an unskilled worker at this plant are around 13 bucks an hour. Any benefits? And benefits, yes. What kind? A, a decent, you know, health health benefits. Okay. I, I forget how many vacations. That's days, 25 not, roughly 25, 26,000 dollars a year plus some benefits. Yeah, in a which place, I got to say, Greenville, South Carolina is not that bad. I it's mean, not it's, right. Yeah, okay. from a New York perspective it's it's and, horrifying, but Before you go on though, what what does an unskilled person in that factory do? What what we we've just heard a very sophisticated, subtle, ongoing learning, et cetera. What what gets done in the factory that you can learn in a day and and do your job? 
Yeah, and by the way, most of the jobs, it's not a day. It's literally five minutes. I mean, I watched a new worker get trained on one machine, and it took, I was recording it for the radio, so I had an exact time, and it took two minutes mm. to train this person. Yeah. And this is the other side of computers and robotics, is that computers are able to... Computers are able to tell highly sophisticated machines how to do other tasks that require no judgment, no discretion on behalf of the worker. Right. So generally, these are assembly jobs. So you, you, um, the, the, the really precision stuff on a fuel injector is happening on the very inner workings of the fuel injector. But then the fuel injector has to be put into a housing, and the housing has to be sealed and attached to another housing. And then put and in a box. Stuff, and, yeah, 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 into a box or whatever, however it's packed. And all the outside stuff that, that isn't, hap- you know, isn't where the action is, isn't yeah. where the precise amount of fuel is. You know, it, it's still done to precision, but it requires nowhere near the half a micron virus <laughs> yeah. size precision that the inner workings need. And so there you have... Um, workers who are basically there to set up automatic machines that um, that will do that. So that that will uh, assemble and and seal the outer housing. So you one machine I looked at it's called a laser welder, but it it's the laser is so tiny it emits this like flame that's like a really out of gas lighter, you know, cigarette lighter or something. I mean, it's very, it's it's a very cute little laser. It's not some big dramatic thing. And so you you know you put one part of the fuel injector outer housing in one place and and in one clamp, and you put the other part in another clamp, and then you press a button and they come together and they the laser welder seals them together, and then you grab them, you run a very rudimentary trouble check. Um, and then you send them on their way to the next stage of assembly where someone shoves them into like a rubber hose kind of thing that attaches to the fuel assembly system. And the workers at those plants, I mean, they, they do have to have a high school degree, but that's almost more, you know, the, the signaling function. Right. I mean, reliability they, they, that they're going to show up and be exactly, diligent. Yeah. And they can ask for a high school degree, so they do. But, um, but there's not really, you don't really need to know anything. I mean, I, you know, and it, it's, I, I focused on young, one young woman who is clearly really bright, clearly really capable of a lot. Um, you know, by her own admission, made some bad choices in high school, ended up as a single mother and um, with a high school degree, but no further education and sort of stuck needing to work to support her two young kids um, without a lot of support from her family. I mean, they're, they're very emotionally supportive, but they don't have money to support her any more than that. And she knows nothing. She doesn't know what metals are being used. She doesn't know much about how a fuel injector works. She doesn't know um, what a micron is. So when I asked her what tolerances she cuts to, she was confused. She thought I was talking about racial tolerance. Um, she didn't understand that tolerance is a word that's used in factories. But she's smart, and she has the potential to do other things, but she's not, for a variety of reasons, like many people, she didn't get on a path that would let her do that. Right, exactly. And, and as a result, she's making $25,000 a year. She's not starving. She has probably some decent things, material things in her life, but her future is limited both by the fact that it's not going to get a lot better and there's a possibility her job's going to disappear. Uh, 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 there, I would say there is a guarantee that her current position will disappear. It's just a question a, of time. Yeah, there's a chance that she'll Say you know that they'll. The, I, I will say the Standard Motor Products. It is a publicly traded firm, but it's still run by the family that founded it 92 years ago. And I deliberately set out to find a. You know, I didn't want to find a kind of cutting edge, like a. You Bad know, choice a, of words there. Right. <laughs> I didn't want to find a. I wanted a firm that wasn't trying to squeeze every penny of profit out. That be, just because. I thought it would be make make for a more interesting, compelling story, and 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 it would. You know, I I didn't want to, you know, all the all the stuff about Bain Capital and Mitt Romney and stuff. I just didn't want to get into that debate. <laughs> like okay. I wanted a company that, you know, 
almost anyone would look at and say, all right, those are decent people. They would love to hire more people. They would love to justify keeping everyone on and never laying anyone off. But they can't because the market won't let them. Right. I mean, to, to do that would mean just going bankrupt. And this is a company, this is not a company that's making, they're making a great year, an amazing year for them is 5% margin, you know, making 5% profit. And, yeah. Well, that's and true that, of everybody in the business, I suspect, even who's trying to squeeze every penny out of it. Just, it's right, a competitive right. business. And, and 5% is a rare year. I mean, usually it's 2 and 3%. The, the amazing thing about it, of course, is that they can't stand still, um, even if they wanted to. They, they, they're going to go out of business if they stand still. They've got to get the switch over time down from the hour and a half to an hour and 23 minutes down to an hour and 17. The price points that their suppliers expect are going to get tougher because their competitors are going to beat them to it if they don't match them. Um, and so, th- and they're going to replace that employee with the machine if they can, because they'll have to. Otherwise, they, they won't, have to, exactly. they, they won't they, exist. They'll go out of business. They're, no matter how nice they are, they're going to go out of business. They're not going to be able to cover their costs with their revenues if they don't stay on the cutting edge, so to speak. Right. And and the big moment, Larry Sills, the CEO, um, he's 72. He grew up in the company. His grandfather founded it. His dad ran it his, with his uncle. His son is now positioned to run it when Larry retires. Um Larry, the company came within spying distance of bankruptcy a few years ago, and in in large part because he just he was still manufacturing in Queens, New York, where nobody manufactures competitive, you know, global globally competitive products. I mean, just you can imagine the costs and hassle and rent, and so and it just he just waited way too long to to make the shift. Um, away from Queens, um, and, and to do some layoffs, and and so they came pretty close to disappearing. And he says he wakes up every morning, you know, and I'm not going to lose this company. I'm not going to let it go bankrupt. But lose this company to him, in part, one of the big threats is private equity, and and he felt like he was a set of investors might make him an offer that the other stockholders won't refuse. Exactly, which yeah. might I mean, his mean... family runs the company, but they only own ten percent of it. And so, uh, you know, he felt that for a while there, he was really vulnerable, that he had, he he was running the operation pretty fat and some private equity person could make a pretty compelling case. Hey, I can come in here, I can make products as well or better, and I can get rid of a lot of dead weight and, and, you know, and and, and increase earnings. And by the way, you know... that's happened all over the manufacturing sector in the last 25 years, and often what the – what's going on is it's somebody who's got modern inventory control techniques and other ways of, of running a business comes into a business like this, a family business that has not kept up with technique because they hadn't had to. They could still get by just a slightly smaller margin. Now all of a sudden – they're at risk of, of being destroyed and the, and the outside investor can come in, apply some of those techniques – Downsize perhaps, substitute machines for people, and and make it a viable concern again. And that happened. That's been happening. You know, it happened all over the Midwest in the, in the eighties and nineties. Well, actually, Larry is that guy. So, so oh, okay. Uh, yeah. What it, you know, what he told me is the world he grew up in, the auto parts world. I mean, it's, it was fascinating to learn about it when his grandfather founded the company. Um, I think in nineteen nineteen, uh, and you know, sort of in the nineteen twenties. It, it was a time when you know, you, you were just beginning to have, you know, really expanded mass production of cars, but there was this real hole where the auto companies were not creating replacement parts. So you just had mechanics kind of making their own little replacement parts when people would bring their Model T or whatever it was. It's like, in. It's like Havana. Right, exactly. Like Havana <laughs> what they now. do now. Yeah. They've yeah. got these yeah, old American exactly. cars and creative people are keeping them going by uh, fiddling. By fiddling, exactly. And so... Um, and and the aftermarket business was sort of this shady world. There was, and and it was a lot of immigrant families. This was a, a Jewish immigrant family. There were a lot of Italian immigrant families, Irish immigrant families that came in, came to America and were looking for a, a shot and and found this as a great opportunity. And their commitment was, you know, now you think standard. Who would make a name a company standard? It's the most boring name in the world. But um, I guess in 1919. Being standard was Comforting. like the most exciting thing you could possibly be <laughs> as a auto parts company, and um, and right through to the seventies, it was hundreds and hundreds of small family-run manufacturers selling to hundreds and hundreds and thousands of small family-run um, 
distributors and 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 uh, and shops and repair shops, and you know in in the seventies and then it increasingly the customer side i mean which for them again is is the big real retailers and you know sort of the auto zone and the, the folks who sort of like the walmart effect you know these big people to getting um creating retail economies of scale um and and big wholesalers doing the same thing and so what he said is in the early 70s his biggest customer was 1% of his business now he has four customers that are like 60% of his business and yeah. If AutoZone or Napa calls him and says, someone else is offering us that exact same fuel injector for four cents less, there, you know, he's got to get four cents figure, out of that fuel injector. Or he, yeah. You know, he loses one of those accounts. That's, you know, that you're starting, you're talking about closing down factories, laying off thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So he, and, and, and on the cost side, He's got, you know, he, his main cost is metal. That, that's a bigger cost for him than labor. And metal is a globally traded commodity. He's not big enough to, you know, strike some deal with Alcoa to get preferential pricing. And so he's really, you know, labor isn't the only cost he can cut, but it's one of the costs that he can cut, one of the main costs that he if, can cut. If he can find a way to substitute machines. And so as you mentioned in the article, he's – you don't – Replace all workers with machines because sometimes workers are cheaper. It's, again, the same issue of China versus the U.S. Sometimes you're going to have coexisting workers and machines, but you're going to be looking for ways when it's possible to do it cheaper, whichever way that is. And it tends to be as labor gets more expensive over time, cheap machinery is going to sometimes dominate. Right. I mean, in the case of Maddie, the young woman that I uh, that I focused on, so she makes twenty six thousand. Let's say with benefits and everything, let's call it thirty thousand a year. And they did the math and. A robotic arm could do what she does more quickly and more precisely, but it would cost $100,000. And their metric is any capital investment needs to pay for itself within two years. And so Maddie makes 30000 over two years, $60,000, um, you know, the net present value of which would be less. Um, so an upfront expense of 100000 it's clear Maddie gets to keep her job. But as the price of the machine comes down? Or if there's more demand for fuel injectors and they add a second or a third shift, the mathematics change quickly. And there certainly are robotics manufacturers out there trying to cut their costs yep. and trying, you know, who are. And Maddie really isn't in a position to cut her costs very much. So um, this and is she, a non-union plant, by the way. But um, but thirteen bucks seems to be about the floor per hour for a manufacturer like this. So, so it's double. Um, it's double the minimum wage, but it's still not a lot of money. Not a lot of money. And yeah. uh, but she knows this, right? She really knows. I mean, well, she knows she's she might not keep her job for the next twenty five years. I mean, which unfortunately, I think what she thinks is this is the highest I'll get, and I'll be stuck here. And I don't think she fully understands. No, no, this is the highest you'll get, and and it's higher than you might be for the rest of your life. You might if be you stuck. You might be stuck somewhere skills. else. Yeah. Yeah. If you're lucky. Now, can I ask you, so, so the mystery that I want to look into, so, so it, it, it strikes me, the low skill, I mean, if, you, if you're talking about people who truly are replaceable, and Maddie does nothing that you couldn't easily get Chinese workers to do or Mexican workers to do, or really, you know, it, it's very simple. I mean, I, you know, you know I, I could not learn how to do what Luke does. I could learn what Maddie does in two minutes. What, no is, Luke, what is a machinist make? But the machinists don't make as much more than as I would think they would. So they make about fifty percent more. Now, making forty-two grand, um, you know, maybe an, an experienced one making fifty grand in Greenville, that's pretty good. That's I a mean, you, nice lifestyle. Yeah, you have a home, you have a car, and your you spouse can go on vacation. Your spouse Crucially might work. in that area. You can get a boat. <laughs> that, yeah. that's one of the markers of, of true middle class life. So, so it, it's you're doing well. And and if and if if a machinist is married to an unskilled worker. They're making seventy-five, and they might be able to, you know, they're going to be able to save some money, have their own house. That's that's a above median lifestyle in, I assume, in Greenville, South Carolina. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the Greenville County, um, 
is it's a very inexpensive place to live and and uh and that that you're doing very well if 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 Maddie marries a skilled machinist yeah. and, and you're bringing in 75 80 grand a year that's great and there are at the BMW plant at some of the higher end plants in town someone like Luke could make um considerably more 30 dollars an hour you know um so that's 70th or so with benefits and yeah that's, exactly that's a is, good lifestyle you know, you know you're start starting to talk about having like a reasonable retirement at 65 and mm-hmm. um if you put away for your 401k and everything yeah. um the the but every manufacturer every manufacturer i talk to says there's not enough skilled workers there are not enough skilled workers we can't fill all the skilled slots we have and the national association of manufacturers which is the big lobbying arm of Yep. American manufacturing, they have this big program trying to get community colleges to issue certificates and to promote this learning. And they're working, I believe, with the Department of Labor. And, you know, they, they say, oh, this is because of snobbery and people don't, you know, high school guidance counselors tell people that manufacturing's dead and everyone, no one understands. But to me, it, I mean, labor markets are obviously far from perfectly efficient or frictionless, but if there really is a shortage, wouldn't wages just rise to fill that shortage? Uh, and, and until, I mean, if, if they started paying, you know, 40 bucks an hour, 45, 50 bucks an hour, um, then wouldn't you start seeing high school kids saying, oh, that, I am interested in that career? Well, That's, you asking me? Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think there's two things going on there. One is talk is cheap. So when they say, you know, we can't find enough of these folks, I, I always wonder what that means. The one question, the obvious question is when you ask, well, why don't you pay a little bit more? And uh, I, I don't know what they would answer to that. So it could be just that it's not as easy as they'd like to find those people. That I'm, So I'm not sure what it means when they say there aren't enough um, to go around in manufacturing of that semi-skilled or whatever you want to call it, highly skilled but specialized set of skills. The other part is the fact that if you – there's a reason that the cost of living is cheap in Greenville, South Carolina. It's that not as many people want to live there as want to live in Queens and, and Brooklyn and Manhattan. Although I got to say, sometimes I wonder why. It's really beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, that's a whole separate issue. It's yeah. – you know, I always make the joke. It's a little farther to a Broadway show if you live in Greenville. Right. Not that, but it's not that much farther because you get touring companies and you know, it's not like it's a, a wasteland culturally. But there obviously are a whole set of cultural amenities and social opportunities and interactions that take place in large American cities that are less active in smaller towns. So that, – and fundamentally, that is the reason that land is cheaper in Greenville and housing is cheaper and so many th- other things are less expensive. It's, it's not as in high demand and we don't have to really speculate what the reason is. It's just that's a fact that people, not as so many people want to live there at, at – at, uh, at the prices as people want to live in New York at that price. So it pushes up the price in New York of access to all those things, whatever that list is, and it's not the same for every person. Um, the other question is, you know, like you say, how much would you have to raise wages to get people to move there? And you wouldn't think it would be to $100 an hour or $75. You'd think it would – if it's 40 for – if it's 30-something for most people, you think 40-something would get you there. And um, – Part of it probably you – know, I wouldn't call it snobbery. Some of it's ignorance, a lack of knowledge that those jobs are out there and some of it I think is literally cultural. The people don't particularly necessarily want to live in those cities. But to have it in Queens, which you, as you said, is just out of, the, is out of the question. Then it's way too expensive. Having said that, I think there's a lot of changes going on in the American labor force that are brought on by this recession where people are opening their eyes to all kinds of things uh, and especially in what they study in school and, and where they study it and – uh, if if we could make our education market a little more flexible, which I think is coming, I think there's going to be a lot of changes in in how in how the, those these worlds work. I mean, I'm extremely right. I'm extremely excited about my uh, job getting destroyed by technology. Uh, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for the American college experience and the American high school experience to be replaced by something that's different. Uh, I'm not exactly sure yet what that will be, but it's going to involve technology and online learning and different ways of learning. You know, if I, I, I want to turn at some point, now's not a bad time to, 
know, whether we have a policy crisis in this area or not of manufacturing, which is going to be a big, I think, issue in the coming uh, political debate in, this, in the election season. But I think we have a crisis in education. A lot of people look at foreign countries and say uh, they do it differently and better. And rather than us trying to figure out, out from the top down what we ought to be doing, I'd get – I'd allow a little more uh, chaos in the education industry. I'd get government out of it and let private – entrepreneurs come up with things that would make the Maddies of the world better prepared for the future because she clearly is not well prepared for the future and she's not alone. There's a lot of lousy high school and some bad college experiences that people choose for themselves or make mistakes and get stuck in and we flexibility is is really the key here. And, and Maddie represents, to my mind, the low-hanging fruit of educational opportunity because, I mean, I've, I've gone Because she's to, smart. <laughs> she's, she's smart. She's eager. She's disciplined. She's, you know, she's, she's ready to go. She's just in a situation, which I'm fairly sure millions of Americans are in, where she has the ability, she has the eagerness, but she has family obligations that require her to work a full-time job. And for me, that was one of the big learnings that I, the reason I chose Greenville specifically is um, I wanted a place where this shift from lots and lots of jobs for low-skilled workers to much fewer jobs for low-skilled workers and then a small number of jobs but better jobs for high-skilled workers. And Greenville is, is a great place to look because it until right through the 90s, it had a textile economy where anybody who wanted to – could go and get a job at a textile plant, and you didn't need a high school degree. I mean, earlier in the century, you didn't need a you didn't need to be seven yet. I mean, you know yeah. that the child sure. labor went away. Um, and what I learned, I, and it didn't get into the article, but it was a fascinating process. Is the kind of bad side of textile mills, the company store, you you you're completely in hock to this evil textile manager. That had largely disappeared by the twenties. That that the the there, it was uh, the labor market was competitive enough, and, and textile workers were able to leave en masse from one plant to another plant. That I'm not saying it was the greatest life in the world, but you you made certainly by by the standards of the day a decent living, and you had some bargaining power with your employer, even as a lower skilled worker, because even without unions, they were able to create group dynamics um, that, that that allowed them to pressure. Their, their employers for better wages or better conditions or whatever it might be. And, and that world, you know, that world is, is completely gone. And one of the things that is lost is on the job training. And I don't mean completely lost, but, but is less available. So, you know, if, if you think of a textile plant in, in the eighties or fifties or twenties, there's people who don't know much. They, they, they have a pretty rote job. And then there's people who know a lot. They know how to set up and fix every machine in the place. But nobody went to college for it. Nobody went to technical school for it. Everyone learned on the job. And so you never face this moment where you needed to decide, do I remove myself from the, the workforce for a period of years to invest in education so that I can have opportunity down the road? Uh, it, it, it came to you, you know, it, it just came to you on the job. And I think that's a real, that's a real loss for someone like Maddie. It, it's standard motor is not in a position. It's a huge investment to take someone like Maddie who has promise, but as the factory manager told me, there is nothing she does in her low skilled job that tells me whether or not she'd be good at the other job other than the most basic stuff. I know she'll show up on time. I know she's a pleasant person. I know she's willing to work hard. Those but I have no information about her math skills, her mechanical thinking, her ability to solve difficult problems under pressure. I just don't know. And the only way I'm going to find out is to pay for her to go to school for two years or three years and then put her on the machine. And then she's and very competitive at other places and you'd lose her. And then, right, you spend all that money and time, and if she's bad, you've lost, that's gone. And if she's good, she's going to want to bid up her wages, and you know her opportunities are broader. And he told me he did at a previous job. They did try worker training programs, and he said about half the people, you know, don't make it. They're, they don't, you know. And and that's what I realized that, you know, I, I feel like I'm pretty bright, I'm pretty well educated. I'm actually pretty good at math and computers, and I'm fairly sure I could never develop that intuitive three-dimensional thinking that you need or nine-dimensional thinking that you need to be able to 
troubleshoot an incredibly dynamic physical process um, just looking at numbers on a screen. I just feel pretty confident that with 10 years of schooling, I still would not get it. In other words, you're grossly overpaid. Okay, fine. <laughs> In other words, I'm let's let's over- move along. Yeah. yeah, let's move along. Exactly. So, so that 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 last mile of 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 um, training is a real problem. And this is all stuff I didn't get into in the article, but um, we have this really weird system in America, the, the government policy. We have something called workforce development offices. And I, I, I would guess every county and many towns and cities have a workforce development office, which is often funded by the Department of Labor, which is out there um, trying to train the workforce for jobs. Then we separately have an economic development process, yeah. which, uh, which, which is that out of the Department of Commerce? I forget um, how, how they tend to work, but it's often the, or it'll be the local Chamber of Commerce or something, which is out there trying to recruit new factories and new businesses. And the workforce development folks are not really in touch as much as you'd like. I'm sure there are exceptions, but I'd say as in a general rule, with the HR managers of, of manufacturers, they're not deeply in touch with what are the in-demand market needs right now. Well, the incentives aren't really there. So it's that, that whole strategy for preparing the workforce of tomorrow is, is not likely to bear a lot of fruit. <laughs> yeah, I, I, saw, um, a, I saw a very depressing version of this in Rochester, New York. Uh, I did some reporting on this. And um, you, the Department of Labor has this program, Pathways Out of Poverty, and I sort of joke that the acronym, or someone told me the acronym is P O O P. It's a yeah. little um, awkward. Yeah, yeah, it's a little indicative of, of their success because, uh, and I don't know the whole program, but what I saw, you had a training program that cost several million dollars to train people to retrofit homes, but the homes were only being retrofitted with another government short-term stimulus spending program. Oh, the weather rising. The weather rising. And so you had all these people go through a training program. This was targeting not the Maddies of the world, but people who had dropped out of high school, often had a prison record, really the, the, the least employable people in our society, people who had never had a job, who you know were basic hygiene and just showing up on time were real issues. And they had a huge attrition rate. I forget the exact number, but you know, a tiny fraction of the people who went through the training would graduate. And then the people who graduated, and I met some of them, were so excited. These are people who had never had a job, and suddenly they have a paying job, and even a decent paying job. And a skill. A skill. Well, they would get a job because they would have this government weatherizing contract. But it doesn't last I, for very long. But it was a it was a fake demand. It, was, it yeah. disappeared a year later, and. You know, there there isn't a natural demand for those skills, and 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 then they're back to nothing. And when I met a lot of those people, they many of them, especially the only one. I mean, this was the ninth, tenth training pro government training program they had been to through, and this was the first one that actually offered them any job. So at least I got a job, if only a short term stimulus based job. But so so training is you know we have lots of training programs, but it, it's somehow not training people for the jobs that they actually might. So let's let's think creatively for a minute. Uh, let's be imaginative. I, I'm just as you're talking about this, it makes me think of of the following, and and maybe um, we're wasting our time here. Uh, but let's talk briefly about. What, I'm going to have a little thought experiment, and then we'll close with some some other policy issues. Uh, so let's talk about the factory. We're at the standard factory. It's um, they're making the fuel injectors. And again, if you haven't been listening carefully, standards the name of the company, not a description of what it produces. So you've got this factory. You have people in the factory who are bright, but either through choices they've made or bad luck or unawareness of what's going on outside, right? Because you talked about the fact that she's kind of stuck there, but it could be just she doesn't know about some opportunities for enrichment or training. You'd think there'd be an opportunity to do the following. You'd think the factory could bring in some training into the factory that the workers would pay for, not the factory. The workers might pay for it, not out of pocket, but in the form of lower wages. So if you offer $10 an hour or $11 an hour, you don't get those workers to to do your job. But you might if you said, look, I'm only paying 10 Your My competitor I know is offering you 13 or, or or 12 But if you come to work for me for 10 your life's going to be tough for a while. But 
I've got this program where you're going to take a break for an hour or two a day or maybe you stay late a couple hours and your kid stays a little longer in daycare. And we're going to help you get the skills that you might be able to use elsewhere in our factory because we decided a few minutes ago that there may be scarce in the marketplace generally. And I'm and I realize that maybe many of the workers who'd like to have those skills aren't going to have the capability of acquiring them. And I'm uneasy about bearing that risk, so I'll let the worker bear the risk in the form of lower wages, and, and we'll have an in-house training program as one of our fringe benefits. We'll bring in a local community college to teach a class on site, or we'll partner with them to make it easier for you to get off work at, at certain times. You'd think those kind of things, and maybe they are happening, but you'd think those kind of things would be desperately helpful to folks who are either eager to get ahead or worried about the fact that they're not going to stay where they are. They're going to fall behind. Is, do you see anything like that going on? What would Larry, your, your C, the CEO of this company, what would he say about that? So I, I actually had dinner with him the other night, and he said that one big outcome of the article is he wants to begin the process of really taking that – taking training – much more seriously. And so, um, and he wasn't, you know, I wasn't interviewing him. I felt like he was being very honest. I, I mean, so my first blush is to really like what you're saying um, and, and thinking, yeah, that, that would make a lot of sense. I think Maddie um, would like that herself. There's sort of a self selection process. Um, some of the, there's a bunch of German companies in Greenville for various reasons, I mean, particularly the BMW plant. And they have this tradition of, of apprenticeship that they yeah. brought, brought over from Germany. And I was talking to, Maddie's sister's boyfriend, who who um, works at one of them, and uh, he said the first few years he learned really valuable workplace skills, but now it's you know it's free training. <laughs> you know, it's more fun to spend a couple hours in a class than yeah, sure. than, than at work. So he's just learning stuff that he just to get out of work. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so, so I maybe, like the idea. Maybe helping him in other ways. You don't know. It's, you know that's the way he describes it. But who? Yeah, yeah. Right, it's, not as, right. it's not as practical. I understand, but I mean, right. for and example, it, you know, you got to say to, to some degree, it's an advantage to the employer. It shows, you know, probably creates a, a feeling of comfort and commitment that allows them to pay a little less because they're paying them in other ways. But so I really like that. The and and I will say, Greenville Tech, Green, Greenville Technical College, the commu- local community college, has a. It, it's not exactly that, but it, it, what they do is they'll work with. The bigger multinationals, like like the BMW or Bosch or Michelin, and, and who will say, okay, we need fifty people who can do blank, who can do this skill, and the school will take care of teaching those people, and and those people are guaranteed if you finish this course, you will get a job at Michelin, which which sounds great, and I'm sure Greenville Tech would love to do what you just described as well. A criticism of that I heard is that it's in the company's interest to train people more narrowly than it might be in their interest. So Absolutely, obviously, but that's again a question of how do you get the people to who's going to pay for it? Can you find a way to either implicitly or explicitly have the employee pay for it? When when I was talking about a class for the lower skill workers, I'm thinking maybe you'd have a class in calculus. You know, there's probably a few people who could – it might take a while to get people up to speed. Its main value isn't to learn how to be a machinist. It's got other applications obviously. But maybe that would be cool. Maybe – but maybe you're too tired at the end of the day too because you got to do homework and, you know, this is not an easy – training and education and learning are not um, – you can't take a pill. So it's, right. it's a little complicated. I also – like for, for – you know, Larry wants to do it and, and I hope he does do it. But But – you know, if we think of a corporation just as a profit maximizing entity, is I mean, don't you just have a host of free rider problems? And you know what? Wh- not if not if you not if you charge not if you pay lower wages, right? You, you one of the advantages of paying lower wages and offering that that quote free training, it wouldn't literally be free. You'd be paying implicitly in the form of lower wages. Is you attract the intellectually curious people who see that as a benefit rather than a waste, right? If you don't have any interest in education, which there'd be other people. Or maybe you have two tracks. You have people who get the you know the education track and people who don't. The education track pays lower wages, but you get the the class. I don't know. I'm just thinking out I, loud. I, I I mean I feel like I I, I like it. I, I the, the, yeah. The only thing that makes me nervous is would would those classes be broad based? You know, highly portable skills like calculus or broad machining technology or metallurgy, or would they be very narrow, less portable skills that are you know that that more 
you know, kind of marry you to that employer. Yeah. No, that's a good question. Yeah. But but what I really like is, is, is the creative thinking and that, you know, thinking that the only way to advance does not need to be you have to leave the workforce or you have to go to night school and and go to, you know, a two year technical college and um and, and you know, spend money while you're not earning money. Uh, well, I do like that I, well, that proposal to to think more more creatively and, well, I think and, and people destroy will. some of the old models. I think people will, and I'm sure there's a thousand problems with with what I suggested. But uh, l- let me close with a with a um, with a with a, a, a very open ended challenge and get your reaction. A lot of people say in America, you know, in 1950, if you didn't finish high school, you still could get a good job in a manufacturing plant. And as you as you detail very clearly in your article. Uh, what's happened since 1950 is American manufacturing has been tremendously healthy. There's been unbelievable increases in, in American manufacturing output. It's manufacturing employment that is a crisis, uh, if if anything, is a, in crisis. It's not manufacturing. It's employment. Now, my reaction to those stories has always been, well, you know, in 1920 or 1925 – it used to be, if you look back on the recent past of 20, 30 years before, people would, 40 years before, people would say, you know, used to be you could graduate with a third grade education and get a good job as a blacksmith. And those jobs are gone. And the answer isn't to bring back the blacksmith. You know, that, that's a good thing that a third grade education didn't prepare you for the workforce in 1925 the way it did in 1885, say. That was great. And we're in that same world today. We're in a world where. 60, 70 years ago, 50 years ago, even 40 years ago, you only had to go to high school and you'd get a good, quote, middle class job with a chance for improving your lot as you went forward. That's not true anymore in general. There are exceptions, of course, but if you just graduate from high school, life is a lot harder than it used to be. Now, part of that is because a lot more people go to college and the people who are left who don't go to college differ from the people who go on to to college and their lives are more challenging. But it, it seems to me – and here's the challenge. It seems to me that there's two things we have to do about that rather than say put up barriers to Chinese manufacturing imports uh, or, or special training programs. What we need to do is let people educate themselves in ways that are more connected to the – the workplace they're about to have and the standard K through 12 model is that we've imposed on – through the government for the last 100 years or so is not very good and it's particularly bad for a certain group of people. Then the other part of it is – and this is the, the mystery to me that – my challenge. You got people who, yes, they go on to college but they study things that aren't very – that are totally impractical, which is fine. I've, I love liberal arts education. I think it makes you more interesting person and parent and all that. But somebody who goes on to high school and, and studies, say, art history or French or psychology even compared to somebody who studies engineering has a very different set of prospects. But even that person who studies psychology or something that's less practical does a lot better than the people who drop out, who don't go to high, finish high school, at least historically. So it seems to me that bo- that may not last. Uh, both of those worlds need to change or going to change through market forces. Yeah, I, th- I had a great talk with um, David Otter, the, the labor economist at MIT, and I mean, he just – what he said is everyone in America is going to have to – I forget the exact words he used, but they're going to have to compete based on what they know how to do. And the the signaling properties of just having a BA um, are, are weakened. Even the, the signaling properties of just having a high school degree have clearly weakened. I will say, unfortunately, for, for high school dropouts, the signaling properties of being a high school dropout are very strong and maybe yeah, stronger no, that's than the, ever. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, very and, tough. And I do think this is a challenge. Like I, you know, I don't personally have much fear for the long term growth of the U.S. I think GDP growth will eventually get on a healthy yeah, no um, growth path. I think um, you know there will be plenty of Americans whose whose lives continue to. To, to be richer and richer. I do think we have a compositional, a potential compositional crisis that, that we've never faced before, which is some large segment of Americans seem poorly positioned to take advantage of that growth. That could, you know, and clearly getting as many of those people as possible to, to be able to acquire the, the, the skills and education that, that, are, that are needed is, is clearly the first best solution. 
I'm pretty much lost myself on, on the second best. And, and I got to say, I ask everyone I can. I asked. I had a very interesting talk with Jeffrey Immelt, who runs uh, President Obama's jobs tra- strategy, and he's. He basically said, I got nothing. What do you got? I got nothing. An honest man. Yeah. That's an honest man. I'm sure he yeah. spends a lot of time. I think in his day, that's his day job. I think it, he, doesn't he moonlight as the head of GE? Yeah, they'd make yeah. some kind of product as yeah. well. I forget. Yeah. What so so yeah. he probably yeah. doesn't spend that much time on that. I, 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 right. I Kind of a masthead figure, I think, more than anything else. Right. Exactly. At least he's honest, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At least he was honest. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that is, I think. How do we create an educational system that that allows people to 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 pursue the skills that that they both want and that are marketable? Um, you know that's crucial. Another thing David Otter told me, I mean, not the exact words, and he'll get mad at me for quoting him. So let me just say, I'll say it that you know having a BA from any school in 1972 meant you were going to have a middle class life. Absolutely. Having you know a poetry degree from a second tier school today. I, I don't know who hires you. I yeah. mean, there's only well, so many jobs in publishing. Yeah, well, they're not going to hire you for your poetry ability, although it's nice. I love poetry. I don't yeah. have anything against it. Yeah, I have a degree in history of religion. So, yeah, I, I don't yeah. – well, that's – I mean I think that's the point. You're bright. Uh, you don't use the skills – this quote skill. I'm putting skills in quotes. You don't use the skills you learned in, in college, although you use some of them. They're they're, they're intangible. There are things about how to write well and how to think analytically perhaps. Those are useful in your job obviously. Uh, but you know, for people who there, – there aren't an infinite number of those kind of jobs going around. There, there are people who struggle to apply those skill, those intangible skills and they'd like some tangible ones. And um, uh, rather than try to create that educational system, I'd like to let it emerge. And uh, we need I think a lot more creativity in how we let that system run. But um, – that's another podcast. Absolutely. My guest today has been Adam Davidson. Adam, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks so much. It's it's a real pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.